Hey there, kids. It's your good buddy, Uncle Zomben. Now that I've returned from the grave, I am hungry for brains and merchandise. Thankfully, before I died, I partnered with Juan Coven to design this sick t-shirt so that you can look awesome in this life and beyond. Click the link in the video description below to get your very own shred till you're undead t-shirt, mask, or whatever else you want my ghoulish face on. Now if you'll excuse me, I've got to meet an old friend for dinner. Hey there kids, it's your good buddy Uncle Ben, and this week I've been listening to Blackwater Park by Opeth. This is the band's fifth album, and it came out 20 years ago, which is a statistic that makes me feel old as fuck. It's also the first Opeth record that I ever listened to, and I was introduced to it by my good buddy and at that time bandmate Derek Tingle. We played together in the band Human Fuse. And Derek was responsible for introducing me to like a ton of really progressive bands that I'd never really listened to much, like Dream Theater, Symphony X, and Opeth. And in today's video, we're going to talk about what makes it so darn cool and why you ought to be listening to it. As always, today's video is brought to you by everybody who supports my channel as part of my amazing Patreon community over at patreon.com slash benellerguitars. Sign up today by clicking the link in the video description, and even for just $1 a month, you get access to a ton of backing tracks, downloadable tabs, bonus lessons, exclusive content, all kinds of cool stuff. It's waiting for you right there, so be sure to sign up today. Thanks. Gear-wise, for today's video, I'm playing my lovely Paul Reed Smith hollow body here into a Pepper's Petals Dirty Tree, which is running in front of this Mesa Boogie dual rectifier that I just got that's freaking awesome. And I'm running that into the Sir RLIR box for direct recording. I'm also going to be using my Spectre Euro LX 5 string bass into the Axe FX3, as well as my lovely Martin SC 13E acoustic. Track number one on the record is the Leper Affinity, which starts off with this super ominous buildup, and then we're treated to one of the most opathy riffs of all time. <laughs> Super ugly sounding riff with tons of dissonance in there. Just everything that Opeth loves to put in the riffs. It's the very first thing that you hear is super tense sounding. We've got essentially like an E power chord, but it's also got this F note in here. Now that F note in reference to E sounds out as what's called a flat ninth, which is one of the most tense sounding intervals that there is. Also this F note ringing out against your open B string sounds out as a flat five or tritone. So within this chord, you've got probably the two most aggressive sounding intervals that there are, the flat nine and the flat five. Two little augmented triads sliding up and down right here. Uh, P.S. a lot of the tabs online have you playing this instead. That's not it, it's actually this. It's a little stair step shape, it's easy to see. And then a cool little lick at the end of the riff. There's a whole bunch of other super sick riffs and solos until we reach about the four minute and 45 second mark. And I'll never forget the first time that I got to this part on the record, because up to here it's been all this like super gloomy, super nasty sounding stuff. And then just out of nowhere it breaks into this beautiful sounding acoustic part. <laughs> At this point, everything about the band just kind of clicked for me, and it just made sense. All the really heavy stuff that we heard earlier makes the really pretty stuff prettier, and then all the really pretty stuff makes the heavy stuff seem heavier and uglier. It's kind of like seeing your dad standing next to his second wife or something. Also love that super spooky transition that they used to get out of that section. <laughs> Now the section before that was pretty well in a diatonic A minor kind of harmony, but this section mixes things up immediately. Our A minor tonality had this C note, but this next section starts off with a C sharp in the bass, but then it's kind of like, just kidding, back to the C, then back to some spooky 
kind of diminished sounding stuff right there with that B flat, E, and G going on. So spooky. Really excellent tune and a great way to kick that album off because it's just kind of the mission statement of everything Opeth all in one song. Super long, kind of winding structure, some killer riffs, a beautiful clean section with some nice melodic vocals. It's kind of everything you need to know about Opeth. Track two on the record is Bleak, which has some really awesome exotic sounding riffs in it. <laughs> Yeah, the first part of that riff is based around the E Phrygian dominant scale. But of course, Opeth can't be contained by the traditional laws of Western music theory for long, so the second part of the riff doesn't really have anything to do with that Phrygian dominant scale. It's something else entirely. Kind of ends with a B major or even B7 tonality, which works to resolve us back around to the E tonality of the first part of the riff. During the verses, we got a guitar playing this melody right here. And this introduces us to one of the stars of the record, the use of an Ebo. I don't actually have an Ebo, so I can't show you what it is, but Google it. It's kind of like what those sustainer pickups do, only it's in a handheld unit. And basically you hold it over one string and it just vibrates that string infinitely with no need to pick it. And it creates this super silky long kind of infinite sustain that you're hearing going on while he's playing that melody. At about five minutes into the song, we've got this beautiful bluesy solo that Michael plays on this super gorgeous like low gain tone. And there's an acoustic riff behind it that's kind of hard to hear in the mix, but it sounds so cool. Something like this. <laughs> that break that we talked about in Leper Affinity where it's in E minor but you've got this C sharp to C move going on in there. You could look at this C sharp E G formation as being part of like a C sharp diminished if you want to or you could look at it as parts of an A7 chord actually. It's like an A7 with no root note attached to it. Really great tune. It's got lots of exotic sounding stuff. It's some beautiful melodies towards the end. I also really like how the song ends with that effect that almost sounds like a, a battery dying in a distortion pedal or something. It's a really cool way to wrap that tune up and make way for the next song on the record, Harvest. My favorite Opeth songs of all time, and I think this is also a good idea of the direction that the band was going to go towards years later. Another thing you got to listen for in this song is all the beautiful layering going on. You got another guitar playing this figure on the top strings. Again, there's that C sharp, that major six we talked about before. You could say this is part of an E Dorian scale kind of the, the funky minor, they use that one quite a lot. And then over the top of that, you got that other really simple electric guitar melody that's just like two or three notes. Kind of reminds me of the way that the Cure layers parts now that I think about it. There's always like a million things going on, but nobody's stepping on anybody's toes. Really hard balance to achieve, but Opeth nails it. So like I said earlier, Opeth doesn't really play by the rules of music theory all that often. And anybody that spent any time studying like the circle of fifths knows that whenever you move to a new key in the direction of a fifth, it's always a pretty easy change on the ears. For example, if I was in the key of E minor, it would be using this set of notes. And then if I change to the minor key a fifth away, one, two, three, four, five, which would be a B minor scale, it's only a little bit different. It's actually only one note different. It's this set of notes that we got down here. So it's a pretty easy change on the ears. I would compare this to going from like speaking German to speaking Swedish. There's a lot of carryover between those two languages. But what Opeth does is 
exactly not that. There's a change that we go from in the intro where we go from E minor to C minor which is a drastic change. Again, to use that language analogy, that would be like going from German to Spanish, where there's just really not a lot of carryover between those two languages. It is kind of jarring, but somehow it, it just works. Those melodies are so cool sounding. I think it was actually a Greg Howe interview that I was listening to a while back where he described music theory as not being like a written law, and maybe we shouldn't even call it theory. We should call it musical tendencies. The keys of E minor and B minor tend to work well together. Doesn't mean that that's the only way it can be, and it doesn't mean there's not other possibilities out there. So never let that evil, mystical looking circle of fifths slow you down. Do a random ass key change. Do what Opeth does. You can pull it off and it can sound awesome. Again, just a beautiful song. I never skip that one. And then that goes straight into one of my other favorites from the record, The Drapery Falls. This song kicks off with one of the coolest chord progressions in Opeth history. Check this one out. The first chord that they're using there is a C minor add nine. So we got root, flat, third, and fifth, just like what we'd have with a regular C minor chord. Only we're also adding in, once again, the ninth. Here. Now we can really hear whenever we put the nine in this octave, how it kind of rubs up against that flat third in the chord. Really tense, really dissonant sounding. Then they just toss that down a whole step to B flat minor nine. Now that guy right there is kind of like a, what would that be, kind of like a B major with a six in it? You got root, third, third, six. And then it also steps up right there to that sharp 11. It's kind of a B lit chord. I guess we can look at it that way. I think they do that octave thing at the end, it might just be the bass, I don't know. And we've got to take a minute here to appreciate one of the most underrated bass players in all of music, Martin Mendez. This guy just always knows how to play exactly the right part without sounding super showy or flashy. He just really plays to the song and plays like a real bass player. Parts like that are an example of what makes Mendez such a badass, killer bass player. He listens really closely to the melodic information the guitars have while interpreting that through the rhythmic information the drums are putting out. In the first part of the bass line, we see him using that ninth, just like the guitars do. And then using that little minor third to nine slide right there too. There's him acknowledging that Lydian kind of aspect that the guitars have in that chord work that I was talking about. And then just kind of joining up with everybody for a nice sounding punchy resolution at the end of that bass line. This song's also got some more beautiful haunting acoustic work in it like this section. Again, a lot of Opeth trademarks right there. That first A minor nine that we hear has that ninth interval, the B in this case. For they also have this flat five going on in there. And there's an F sharp note. Now again, to A, an F sharp sounds out as a six again. I guess we're kind of learning here that Opeth is really like a wine em, dine em, six and nine em kind of band, aren't they? 
After that, we get to the epic and extremely dreary Dirge for November. This is an interesting tune to me because it's really only a few parts that all get played a bunch of times. And this is a, a really strong first impression that I had about this record whenever I listened to it way back in the day, is that there's so many sections in here that just repeat and go on and on and on. It was really like very testing for my attention span, you know? Whereas most bands would play a riff like two times, Opeth will do it eight or even 16 times in a row, just to kind of let this like mood and this atmosphere develop. love the way that song kicks off with just that solo vocal and acoustic guitar. It's all free time. It's just like very intimate and human sounding. And then you get that beautiful progression over A minor that just goes over and over with that really nice melody on top of it before it gets super bleak and heavy again. The ending of the tune is definitely my favorite part with that beautiful finger style guitar section. Way back on Weekend Wank Shop 207, I did a full breakdown on how to play those chords and an analyzation of what else going on. So be sure to check out that episode and find the tabs over on Instagram just by searching for hashtag Weekend Wank Shop 207. Up next, we get to maybe the most intense song on the album, The Funeral Portrait. Also one of my favorites. Every song on this record is one of my favorites. Let's just make that clear. Especially after those really beautiful chords that we had at the end of Dirge for November. I love how this song just kicks right in with that really ugly... dissonant 12-string guitar part. And over the top of that, we got this bad Larry of an electric guitar riff. <laughs> simple, so heavy, kind of reminds me of your dad's second wife. Okay, I do kind of have to ruin this for you though because there's part of this song that cracks me up every time that I hear it and it's in the tune a few times. First time you hear it is right around a minute nine whenever he says this line right here. I literally can't hear that section without thinking that he's saying booby eye shit fuck. I always get a chuckle out of that part because I am essentially a five-year-old. Honestly, the song just has too many sick riffs in it to count, but one of my favorites is this one that comes in pretty early in the song. There's actually another part of this song that cracks me up too, right at four minutes and 20 seconds before the guitar solo. The lyric that Michael is like screaming right there says, perish at my hands. And then it immediately goes into like a bitch and ass guitar solo. There's just something about the imagery there where you've got this like deadly threat followed by like sick guitar licks that just kind of cracks me up. That solo is played by the band's former lead guitar player, Peter Lindgren, who left the band several years after this record. And I always thought he was such a great fit for the band because Michael's soloing style tends to be a little bit more simple and bluesy. And Peter's style is a little bit more, let's say, scalar and modal. Second to last track on the album is the super chill instrumental Patterns in the Ivy, which is just acoustic guitar and piano. I don't think it's anywhere to be found on Spotify, but you can go here on YouTube and look up Patterns in the Ivy 2, which is a bonus track that wasn't on the original version of Blackwater Park. It's not instrumental, but it's gorgeous, really cool acoustic guitar and vocal song. Definitely recommend checking that one out. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
beautiful A sus two before he slides into that minor third. Or again, we've got that rub between the minor third and the nine in there again. They use that all over this record. Now the section that's after that. Is another example of a bunch of chords that don't really make any sense together, but sound awesome. You've got an F major kind of Lydian sound with that B note, the sharp 11, like a Lydian scale has. It's more like an F sharp mixolydian sound. G minor 9, and then this guy. So this, I, at first I thought it was like a G sharp augmented chord, but it's not because it has a flat 9 in here. So it's like root 3rd, sharp 5, flat 9. So I guess you could say it's like a G sharp altered chord. Those chords make no sense from a theory perspective, but I do love how it creates this walking bass line that leads you up chromatically from F to F sharp to G to G sharp back to A again. Again, I love that section right there too. Beautifully dissonant. And then, it's like the morning after a rainstorm. That section's got another ending too. That kind of plays around with that, is it a major six or is it a minor six kind of tonality that they used earlier in the record. Having that odd set of intervals all in the same riff, that major six and that minor six, it really creates a feeling that's hard to describe. It's like, it's not conventionally happy or sad sounding. I think that's what Opeth is at their best whenever they do, creating these riffs out of scales and chords that don't really make any sense, but that makes it hard for us to pin down exactly what they're making us feel like. It's worth adding too that there's also an extra bonus track you can find on YouTube called Still Day Beneath the Sun. That's another acoustic guitar and vocal song. It's kind of like a, really like a Joni Mitchell style song, honestly. Really cool tune. I recommend listening to that one too. Last song on the album is the title track, Blackwater Park, and somebody must have called Al Borland and Tim the Toolman Taylor, because it's tool time. We're dropping the D. Throughout their career, anytime Opeth busts out a drop tuning, it's time for some serious, big ass riffs, and this song is no exception. Super sick riff and it's playing around with some more really ugly intervals. So this is all based around D, obviously. And there at the first of the riff we have the root. And then kind of this major seven. So you get this nice tension between that major seven and the root. And then this flat nine. So it's kind of like we've had D, the note a half step below it, C sharp, and the note a half step above it, D sharp, all kind of happening in the same riff, which is a really tense sound. And then of course that big old flat five, the tritone happening there at the end of the riff. All the meanest intervals in one convenient package. Also some cool theory nerd stuff going on right here because that riff is clearly based on like D blue scale, right? You got the root, flat third, fourth, Flat five, regular five, just good old bluesy stuff. But the guitar solo that I'm pretty sure is by Peter Lindgren again, again, it's a little bit more scalar, so I assume that it's him, isn't based around the D blue scale at all. It's based around D harmonic minor. Kind of has an A Phrygian dominant tonality and a lot of the positions that he's using are reflecting that. But against kind of that harmony of D, we would hear all those notes as being harmonic minor. Again, it's really all about those unconventional choices that Michael and Peter made all over this record on the guitar parts that make it so damn cool. 
But there you go guys, Blackwater Park, one of me and Turkey's favorite records ever. Be sure to let me know what you think about this video in the comments section and if you want to see more videos in this format in the future here on my channel. Thanks so much for watching this video. Be sure to click the like button and subscribe to my channel for new content coming at you every single week and ring the bell for notifications every time I upload a new slice of fried gold. Keep in mind, for every like that I get on this video, I give Turkey a pet. That's right. And don't forget, if you want to gain access to a ton of downloadable tabs, backing tracks, bonus lessons, and so much more, be sure to support my channel over on my Patreon page, patreon.com slash benellerguitars. And don't forget to click the Threadless link down there in the video description below to get your own Shred Till You're Undead merchandise today. Thanks again for watching. I get away from the computer and go listen to some Opeth. Less clicking, more picking. That'll never get old.